Hello everyone, um, I'm here to present KVM, a complete formal semantics of the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, these are the authors on this paper. I am the first author here, Everett Hildenbrandt. Uh, this was a joint work between people at the University of Illinois, Runtime Verification, Cornell Tech, uh, and East China Normal University. Um, so yeah, big long author list. A lot of people here helped out immensely with all the tooling and fixing issues in K as we found them. Um, and then a lot of people contributed directly as well. And I uh, figure we should acknowledge everyone who helped out with the tooling because that's important uh, as much as the direct contributions. Um, here's the overview of my presentation. First, I'm gonna walk through a little bit about the K framework. Uh, then I'm gonna talk about the Ethereum virtual machine. Then I will talk about current uses of KVM and future work that we have. Uh, here are some repositories that you might be interested in after the um, presentation. First one is KVM itself. The second one is K itself. Then Runtime Verification's website. Then our Verified Smart Contracts repository, which where we put all our open source Verified Smart Contract code. You can use that as a template for verifying your own smart contracts if you're interested. So first, K-Framework. Uh, the vision is language independence. So we wanna separate the development of PL software into two orthogonal tasks. The first one is building the programming language. So you have a programming language expert build a rigorous definition of the programming language, and they can incorporate all their knowledge that they have of programming languages in doing this. Uh, completely separate is the tooling around the language. Well, not completely separate, you want it to, you know, know about the language itself. But for instance, you know, people might make a parser for C, they might make a parser for Java, and there's a lot of similarities between them. So you kind of want one parser that you can instantiate to all the languages. Same with your interpreter, debugger, compiler, model checker, and verification engine. So the idea of K is we separate these two tasks into two separate tasks, and then you know, we can focus on building the tooling around all the different languages. And then as people need, they can build the actual languages that they need. This has worked pretty well so far. Here's kind of a visual representation of the same concept. Here you have your formal language definition, and from that we derive the interpreter, derive the parser, derive the test case generation, deductive program verifier. So these two right here, the compiler and test case generation, are kind of more in the vision phase right now, and the rest of these actually exist. Um, so there's kind of already a lot of tooling that we have around uh, all these languages that we have semantics for. Here's some examples of some of the languages we have semantics for um, and their primary, their primary usage that we have for those semantics. The first one is C, where we can, one of the primary uses we have of that is detecting undefined behavior. We have the semantics of Java, uh, where we can detect racy code. We have the semantics of EVM, uh, where we can verify smart contracts. The so semantics of LLVM for doing compiler validation the semantics of JavaScript for finding disagreements between JavaScript engines, and the semantics of P4, which is the software-defined network data layer verification. I included that one in there to show that you don't necessarily have to stick to just programming languages when defining the semantics of things. Just arbitrary transition systems are also good. Um, and there's many others um, less used semantics, but you can go to our uh, GitHub organization to see all the ones we maintain, and then there's you know several that other organizations maintain as well. Okay, so let's get right into some of the details about K. So we build concrete syntax of the programming language using this EBNF style. Uh, here we're declaring a new type or sort, as I'll call it, called exp, uh, where we say that all integers and all identifiers, which are just essentially lowercase names, are of type ex expression, but also we can build expressions, you know, as multiplications of expressions or as additions of expressions. And here, notice that this uh, right arrow here means that plus is looser binding than the, than the multiplication, so then we can parse uh, expressions correctly. And then here also we say that you can put expressions in brackets um, using parentheses, and this bracket annotation basically says that we don't actually care about the parentheses. The statements of our programming languages are pretty simple. We have assignment and we have uh, sequencing. So we can do an expression, a statement followed by another statement and we can return. So now we can, just from this grammar right here, we can correctly parse a program like this. A, which is an identifier, 
is equal to 3 times 2, b is equal to 2 times a plus 5, return b. So we're not actually doing anything with this program yet, we're just uh, able to parse it uh, with, with this part of the grammar right here. And notice also here I don't have to put any extra parentheses because I said that the plus is looser binding than the times. You have to tell k a little bit about the structure of your state for your programming language. To do that, we declare what's called a configuration. The configuration here has three cells. The k cell, which will contain the initial parsed program, as indicated by this dollar sign PGM. The environment cell contains bindings of all the variable names that show up in the program to their store locations, and the store actually contains the uh, values that the variables are bound to. So here's some example rules, which are transitions in this transition system. Here, for example, is variable lookup. Here, if at the front of the K cell, we have some identifier. So here, this would happen if we were trying to execute this statement right here. Oh no, not this statement, because there's no identifiers on the right-hand side, but this statement right here. When we tried to essentially execute this A right here, what will happen is A will be pulled out to the front of the K cell using some uh, K magic that I haven't gone over yet, and I, and I won't go over in this presentation, so you can see the tutorial for that. Uh, once the identifier is at the front of the case cell, we look up in the environment where the correct store location for that variable is, and in the store, we then look up what the value associated to it is. So what I'm not showing you here is the negative rule, which says what if x is not in the environment, or what if sx is not in the store, um, but you can make a rule for that as well. Uh, and basically what we do is if, you know, we're trying to look up a variable, we just replace it with its actual value. So here we've grabbed the value from the store and we replaced it right there. Similarly for assignment, uh, instead of lookup, we have some variable that we're assigning to here and we're assigning some integer to it specifically. And notice we do the same thing. We go through the environment, we look up X, find the store location, and at that store location, we take the old value V and replace it with the new value I, which comes from here. Um, so notice here there's two rewrite arrows right there. Here there was only one rewrite arrow, so there was only one small change to the overall state. Uh, but here the two rewrite arrows means that these two changes happen simultaneously to the state. So we consume this and replace it with nothing at the same time as updating the value in the store. Okay. Okay, I'm going to walk through an example execution to really drive this home. Um, here's our program, our initial program, a equals 3 times 2, b equals 2 times a plus 5, return b. Here is our initial configuration uh, where I have you know, set up some stuff here that you know, would have to actually be set up, but I've just set it up. So a is pointing at store location 0, which is initially value 0, b is pointing at store location 1, which is initially value 0. Um, here's the entire program. The first thing that's going to happen is we're gonna take this semicolon right here and we're gonna turn it into this squiggly arrow which means followed by NK. So basically that means we're focusing in on this part of the computation uh, as opposed to right here where we're focusing on the whole computation, we're kinda of just focusing on this part. And notice I've also simplified this three times two to just a six, uh, which is a step that would happen. But now if you inspect this, you can see that this X colon equals int matches this A colon equals six, so then x is a, so we look up a in the environment, and it's pointing at 0, so sx is now 0, and we look up 0 in the store, and it's pointing at 0. So this v goes to 0, but we're going to replace it with this i right there, which is this 6. So in the next state, we will see this 0 is now a 6, and indeed there it is. Uh, and you'll also see that this goes away to nothing. Boom, it's nothing. Okay. So now we have the rest of the computation to deal with. And so I'm skipping a bunch of steps here, but basically what's going to happen is it's going to evaluate this sub-expression first. And to do that, it's going to pull out, it's going to first focus in on the 2, it's going to say the 2 is already evaluated, then it's going to focus on the A, and it's going to say the A is, already, is not yet evaluated. And that's what's happened here. The A is not evaluated, and it's followed by B with this hole in it marking, okay, when you do evaluate that A, put it back in that hole. But now we have an identifier at the front of the K cell, which is X. So once again, we say, okay, what is the store location associated with that? A, this is the store location. Then we look at the store right there, and we get this 6. So in the next step, this will be replaced, as per this rule, with the 6. And we got the 6 right there. 
And then basically we're just going to plug this back into the hole here, um, which is stuff that K will do for you. And so we do that, and now we have B is equal to 2 times 6 plus 5 which simplifies out to b is equal to 17. And then we do the variable assignment rule again to now update this location in the store with 17. OK, so that was kind of an example execution of k, just to kind of step through and see. You know, the main, the main thing to, to think about is this followed by arrow, but I just wanted to make sure that people are at least familiar with k syntax. Now I'm going to switch topics completely and talk about the Ethereum virtual machine, uh, just to give people an idea of what the challenges there are. Um, and first I'm going to talk about what a blockchain is, uh, and just the basics of what I need for this talk, basically. So a blockchain is an append-only ledger of transactions submitted by users. Uh, the transactions are usually just transferring some sort of value. So you know, I might say, I want to pay party X some money, and party X might want to say they want to pay party Y. And then both those transactions get recorded in a sequence that uh, eventually records that you know, party X has this much money and party Y has that much money. Um, so yeah, so like Bitcoin, for example, can do simple transfers of value and some simple logical things that are kind of hard-coded into Bitcoin. Uh, and then miners basically select which is the next pool, the next block of transactions to include on the blockchain, and that's how we achieve consensus. So I'm not going to talk about consensus algorithms here. It's also an interesting topic, but it's not necessary for what we're talking about. What Ethereum adds on top of Bitcoin, because most people are more familiar with Bitcoin or have heard of it than Ethereum, is first of all, it's a different currency. So there's you know, a different exchange rate and different market. Uh, the accounts also have an associated storage and code which they can modify and read from uh, in a transaction. So an account might be able to, in, when an account initiates a transaction, it's able to say, I want to change my storage location three to have this value instead of this other value. Uh, so other accounts cannot modify or read storage locations other than you know, just inspecting it externally because everyone has to know all parts of the blockchain state. Anyway, it's all public. So I can look at an account and say like, oh, I can indeed see that at storage location three, it has the value four. Uh, but if I execute a transaction, unless I'm the owner of that account, I can't in the program directly read that value. So it's kind of this permissions thing that's going on there. Uh, the same with the code, only the account itself can kind of, you know, read the code to execute it. So you have to have that account's permissions to execute its code. Um, yeah, so the transactions can also have associated programs written in EVM, which is the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, and if you're a cool kid, you'll call these programs smart contracts, or just contracts if you get sick of saying smart all the time. Miners then you know, because we now have these associated chunks of code with the Ethereum programs, the miners have to execute this transaction code to calculate the new world state afterwards. So I might send a transaction that says, in my storage location, update this value to this new value. And the miner needs to check, you know, okay, did the update actually happen? And then it needs to store that in memory because it might affect the results of a future transaction. Um, so there's kind of this, this stateful component to it where the miners have to hold around all this extra state uh, to decide whether future transactions are valid or not. So that's a big difference between Ethereum and, and you know, a, a different system like Bitcoin is that you have these programs that have some sort of stateful component to them uh, when they're executing. Okay. Uh, here's an example EVM program. It's a very low level byte code. So it's a stack based byte code over 256 bit words. This program sums the number from zero to 10 basically. So I picked this program because it already demonstrates kind of a lot of the pains of EVM itself. Um, first of all, like just looking at this, I don't see that it sums the numbers from one to 10 or from zero to 10 in any way, shape or form, but that's indeed what it does. So here what I'm doing is saying at memory location zero, store the value zero. So this is uh, the current sum. At memory location 32, store the value 10. So you might ask, like, why don't you store it at location 1 instead of 32? And it's because EVM, op, EVM words are 256 bits wide, but when you use this opcode mstore and the kind of dual opcode mload, it actually does it over bytes instead of over words. So this is actually ends up being a major pain. I'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, here's the marker for the beginning of the loop head, which is going to loop through. This is basically the condition of the loop. And then if the condition is false, then we jump 
to the end of the program, which is this is the marker for the end of the program, basically. Um, and then here we are loading the current, the current sum, the next number to add to the sum. We're adding them together and we're storing it back in the sum. And then here we're loading the current counter and decrementing it by one. Uh, decrementing it by one, yeah. And then storing it again, basically. Uh, and then here we're jumping back up to the top of the loop. So notice here we're not saying like jump and then some string that says loop head like a, you know, a sensible IR that has labeled jumps would have. Instead we are you know, pushing the value 10 and somehow you just have to know that this is at opcode position 10 um, based on the width of all these opcodes before it. Um, so you might think initially, you know, oh, it's opcode position 6 because there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, but that's not the case because these aren't all necessarily one byte wide. So that's kind of one of the nuisances of the EVM is, you know, you have to calculate these jump positions manually or something. It's, it's really kind of a nuisance. Um, then there's this other component of execution where if you submit a transaction that is infinite, just has an infinite loop, you could just say while true, add one or something. Um, then the miners would just sit there trying to execute it and figure out what the state update is because they need to know the state update to know if future transactions are valid. Um, so we have to have a way to prevent this. So this is for DOS attacks. And the solution is that each opcode is going to cost some amount of gas to execute. So like add costs three gas or something like that. And gas is convertible with ether at an exchange rate uh, decided upon at transaction time basically. Any unspent gas is refunded back to the original payer for the transaction, and any spent gas goes to the miner. Um, so it incentivizes the miners to kind of pick up transactions and execute them and actually include them in the blockchain. Um, there's a couple of notes here that I'm, that I'm putting down because they're not, you know, you might think, okay, gas, that's, it, you know, okay, sure, we'll just make a gas model, we'll assign arbitrary values, but it's actually really important that the uh, gas costs charge according to the actual used compute resources, and, as in like the physical silicon, how much you know, energy and time and you know, memory went into doing the computation. It's very important that the gas actually charge for this. Uh, otherwise, you could open up attack vectors, basically, where you submit a computation that doesn't cost very much gas because you were clever about how you structured it, uh, but ends up using just a ton of memory resources, and that would be a way to DOS the miner, for instance. Um, another thing is, you know, new hardware is always coming available, so tuning gas costs is an ongoing challenge. It's, it's something that you have to constantly be able to do. Um, so, for instance, what happens is hard forks roll out, um, basically hard fork just means changes to the network, uh, roll out which uh, update the gas costs of various opcodes as they find out that they were under cost or over cost or something like that. Um, so gas is something that people kind of dismiss at first, but it is a very important kind of ingredient of the whole uh, executable blockchain paradigm. Okay, intercontract execution is another kind of uh, sticky point with the EVM uh, that you know maybe maybe could have been designed a little bit better. So uh, you know. We want contracts to be able to call other contracts because we want library code and stuff like that. But the way that it happens in EVM allows for re-entrancy because basically I can call another contract and then that, call, that contract can call back into my contract, which might trigger a modification in my state. And then it returns the control flow back to the contract I called and then returns the control flow back to me. And I might think in my contract there was no updates to my state while I made the call into the other contract. But in fact, the other contract triggered an update in my own state. Uh, this is called re-entrancy, um, and there have been a lot of funds lost to re-entrancy attacks, basically, uh, where people have crafted clever, con crafted clever transactions which, uh, you know, trigger kind of a re-entrancy cycle and just end up draining funds from contracts. A famous one is the DAO uh, attack. Um, Basically, when you call another contract, the payload that you give it is just a raw string of bytes. I'm going to call it call data here because that's what it's called in KVM. Um, but external to the EVM, everyone has kind of agreed upon what's called the Ethereum ABI, which is application binary interface, I want to say. Um, so the, the Ethereum ABI specifies calling conventions, so how to interpret the call data correctly, as well as some high-level types and their mapping to EVM words. So it's just kind of a, a document specifying this is how uh, 
contracts will interpret this call data when they're called with it because that isn't specified at the level of EVM itself, which has pros and cons, specifying it above versus, versus in the EVM itself. Um, so I'm going to emphasize again the nuisances. First is unstructured control flow. Uh, you can dynamically calculate jump destinations. This is a nightmare for static analysis engines um, that want to be able to infer things about the programs uh, based on its control flow. The second is uh, these 256-bit words. This one's kind of, eh, it's, it's hard to know because it is useful for crypto libraries which often return things that are in units of 256 bits wide, but it's really hard to map it directly to hardware, for instance. So it's kind of it's hard to decide if that's a, a necessary nuisance or not. Uh, what definitely is, I think, an unnecessary nuisance is this 8-bit word array local memory that I mentioned before. So remember in this program, uh, you know, the first thing we had to store was at location 0, and then the second thing we have to store is at location 32, and that's because when we store a 256-bit word, it takes up, you know, 32 bytes worth of storage, which is what this mStore stores as. So if we're doing symbolic reasoning, uh, and we end up hitting an M store, we basically have to take the symbolic expression, split it into 32 symbolic sub-expressions, store each of those 32 symbolic sub-expressions, and then you could even like shift over by some non-32 byte amount, read back in, you know, and you, you end up with just this huge messy symbolic expression describing what your, what your current state is. Um, so it, it can really kill symbolic reasoning, um, this 8-bit word away thing. Um, no built-in calling conventions, so this, this ABI is declared external to EVM. Like I said, this, is, this could be good or bad. Um, it's bad because it means that basically everyone has to agree externally on what the ABI is, and also it's kind of fragile, so people's contracts might implement the ABI incorrectly, and that could open you up to security risks. Um, but it might be good because then you kind of have some notion of upgradability. You can say, I am ABI 1.0 or ABI 1.1 or something like that. Um, so, you know, not really sure. Maybe it's, maybe there's some that could be done at the level of the EVM itself instead of all of it being done externally. Um, and then basically the last one here is this eval capability. So there's basically a sequence of opcodes you can call an EVM which can load, you know, arbitrary data as a program and then execute it. And this is once again just a nightmare for uh, both static analysis and symbolic reasoning, because basically you have to just assume anything could happen. Um, so, yeah, so these are kind of some nuisances with the EVM that it would be nice if we could kind of evolve away from them. Uh, and all of these nuisances are directly related to security issues. Um, you know, some of them are related to security issues like this one because it makes doing various analyses on the program difficult, which you need to do, you know, formal analyses on the programs for security issues. And other ones are more security issues uh, because you could just execute arbitrary code. Um, yeah, but most of it has to do with, you know, actually enabling analyses on the, on the uh, bytecode level. Okay. So uh, now I'm going to talk about KVM, what it's used for. So once again, KVM is the K specification of the EVM. So we've specified all the gory details of EVM in K. You can go to our repository, which was at the beginning of the uh, talk, if you're interested in seeing the actual definition itself. I figured it was probably um, not worth the time to explain the definition piecemeal here. Um, just uh, um, This is pulled from the paper. Um, we passed the VM tests and the general state tests of the official Ethereum test suite, which is on GitHub. Uh, and we're about an order of magnitude slower than CPP Ethereum, which is a native implementation of the um, Ethereum client, basically. These numbers are kind of old, so that number might have actually improved by now because there have been several performance improvements which have gotten into it. Um, but these are the numbers at the time that the paper was written. <coughs> So in case you're interested, you can look at our paper to see more about how these numbers were collected. Um, but you know, there's, plenty of, there's plenty of kind of analyses engines out there for EVM bytecode that don't even bother executing the tests. But it's important to us that we have this correctness benchmark that we, that we pass. So we execute the tests, we make sure that our specification is correct. Um, one thing that we have is kind of some light anti-pattern encoding uh, stuff. So 
EVM has this designated invalid opcode, and initially it was just thrown in because they figured, you know, maybe we need an invalid opcode for something or another. Uh, basically, if it's ever encountered, execution halts, and all the gas is given to the miner. So you don't get your gas back if invalid is hit. Uh, but people have been using it in the high-level languages, which I abbreviate as HLL here, um, to encode kind of assert false sort of statements. So, so this can be, you know, in your Solidity code. Solidity is a programming language that compiles down to EVM. You can put essentially an assert false um, within some conditional, and that, sh that will tell the Solidity compiler this should never happen. Uh, and then if it does happen, something has gone horribly wrong, throw invalid and, you know, get the heck out. Because if you throw invalid, it will also revert any state updates that have happened uh, during that execution. So uh, basically, we can just use K, because it has a symbolic execution engine, to symbolically execute the program and see does it ever end in a state where invalid was thrown. Um, this is a pretty, really simple technique, and it, you know, it works decently. Other, other tools have done similar things with the invalid opcode. For example, the Solidity compiler will you know, try to do some sort of similar analysis by taking its own kind of internal semantics of Solidity, building a Z3 query, and then, uh, or an SMT lib query, and then asking Z3, you know, does it, you know, is it feasible that I could reach this invalid opcode? So this is a kind of nice technique um, that people are leveraging. More of what you can do with K as opposed to other uh, formalizations is you can do full program verification. Um, so I'm not going to go into super great detail here, but if you, you know, are interested, you can look up uh, this paper right here, Stefanescu et al., 2014, for how K's uh, verification engine works. Um, and then there's also some papers on matching logic that you can look up, which is kind of more recent, uh, more recent formalism for, for this work. Uh, so runtime verification is uh, kind of one of the companies that's largely driving the efforts behind K. And they offer audits as a service, basically. And the typical process is first you start off you know, specifying the high-level business logic in English. And oftentimes, developers haven't even done this step. Um, they just kind of start hacking away at code. So we'll you know, write down a high-level English description of what we think their business logic is, go to them. You know, they'll say, no, this isn't quite right, this isn't quite right. We refine it. We go back to them until they say, yeah, it looks good. Uh, and then, boom, they have a nice you know, text description of what their contract is supposed to do. Uh, then we take that high-level business logic and we refine it to an actual mathematical definition. Uh, this should probably not say of logic. That would be kind of extreme. but just a mathematical definition of their contract. Uh, and then once again, we go to the customer and we say, you know, is this correct? Does this look good? And they say, once again, no, there's some bugs right here. And we say, oh, okay, we'll go back and edit your English one and this mathematical one to kind of fix this. And then eventually, once we've gotten through that process, we refine it to a set of K reachability claims. Uh, and once again, we take the reachability claims of the customer. We ask them, you know, does this look good? Does it look like what you're actually trying to, trying to prove about your thing? And once they confirm that indeed that is, we kind of start just fixing bugs in the contract and in the specification, because you know, we could have little bugs in the specification, until the K-prover is satisfied. And then we just send all of that to the customer, basically. So that's, that's how the, the kind of iterative uh, verification as a service process goes. Um, which is a lot more hands-on than some of the other tools that are being offered there. But because of that, you know, it catches a lot more things. So there are also independent groups using KVM to verify smart con their smart contract stack, uh, e.g. Dapp Hub. They, you know, we help them out. They, they submit bug fixes to K, and you know, we help them out with their work when we can. Um, but slowly more people are using the, the K prover independently. Um, OK, so the reachability logic prover uh, takes an operational semantics as input, which in our case, we use a K definition to specify that operational semantics. Uh, and there's no axiomatic semantics required. Basically, it just needs the operational semantics, and it kind of turns it into an axiomatic semantics. Um, the reachability logic is a generalization of whore logic. So if you have a whore triple here, pre, code, post, you can turn that directly into a reachability claim here, uh, where the code here has had its variables or some subset of its variables turned into logical variables. 
uh, and we use the matching logic conjunction here, matching logic and, to uh, limit to instances of this code which satisfy this precondition. And then we say, does every instance uh, that every instance of this code that satisfy this precondition reach an instance that satisfies this post condition? Um, so I've written it out in English here. Any instance of code which satisfies pre either does not terminate, so we don't we say everything is true about non-terminating paths, or it reaches an instances of the empty program epsilon. Uh, which satisfies the post condition. So here I'm claiming it's a generalization of Hoare logic. Um, one way that it's a generalization is that we don't need epsilon to be empty in re reachability logic. We can easily just make epsilon some intermediate program state, um, and then it is a generalization of Hoare logic. It's also not really fair to say it's a generalization of Hoare logic because reachability logic is a logic in its own right. It, you know, it has its own inference system independent of the operational semantics that you plug in. Uh, orthogonal to that, whereas Hoare logic is more of a design pattern. You know, you take some programming language and you kind of build the Hoare logic for that programming language. So it's not really even fair to say it's a generalization as much as more kind of the right way to do it. Um, so reachability claims are fed to the k-prover as just normal k-rules uh, because basically this arrow is just the same as the rewrite arrow, but instead of interpreting them as axioms like the operational semantics is interpreted, they're interpreted as uh, proof goals, basically. And so it will use the axioms, the operational semantics, as well as the inference system of reachability logic, which has, I think, seven rules, um, to try to prove these formulas, basically. Uh, and then a couple things I want to mention relating to security is that functional correctness is directly specifiable as a set of reachability claims. And there's kind of the adage, at least I've seen a lot in like the Linux or open source community, that often security bugs are just normal bugs in your program. So if you specify enough functional correctness uh, properties, you can recover a lot of high-level security properties, basically. So for smart contract verification, we can, uh, because every program is terminating, pretty much every property we could want, we can specify as a reachability property, because we don't have to even think about these non-terminating instances where we just prove everything true. Um, yeah, so that's, that's most of what I'm going to say about reachability logic prover. Uh, here is this ERC-20 case study. It's in the Verified Smart Contracts repo, if you go back to the beginning of the presentation and see it there. Um, it's kind of a hello world of Ethereum smart contracts. It's a very simple contract. Basically, you have in your storage a mapping from addresses to values, and the addresses are interpreted as you know people's accounts, and the values are interpreted as how much of your token that you have. So it's, it's pretty versatile sort of contract. You can make like these little sub economies with your own rules in them um, because you can just dictate how this key value store is allowed to be updated by the people who own the addresses. You can just write whatever logic you want for that. Um, but there's basically a core set of methods that everyone agrees your ERC-20 has to implement, um, including like the ability to transfer some value from one of the accounts to the other account, um, the ability to buy some, some uh, tokens using Ether, stuff like this, pretty much most people agree. So I'm just putting some kind of uses up here. You can codify ownership um, distribution of a company. So it's like tokenizing equity. This would be like, uh, you know, if, if you think about an IPO or initial public offering, you can have an ICO, an initial coin offering, which have caught a lot of press recently. But it doesn't have to, you don't have to actually do an ICO. You can just use it to kind of codify you know, who owns how much of a company. Similar sort of things with like pink slips and deeds uh, for cars and houses. You can codify a Ponzi scheme directly and, you know, tell people to buy into it and tell them it's a Ponzi scheme and you'll watch people buy into it. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I, I put that there as tongue in cheek just because, you know, of course you can codify a Ponzi scheme because it's just a logical set of rules about, you know, how the contract should operate basically. Um, but either way, it's kind of all built on this simple ERC-20 concept. Um, so there were some problems we ran. ERC-20 was the first example we tackled with, with verification. There were some problems we ran into reg regarding those nuisances of the EVM that I was talking about earlier. So this is how we tackled those problems. Um, <clears throat> first, we had to define a bunch of state abstractions directly in K itself. It was nice that we could do it directly in K. Uh, what was not nice was how <laughs> 
you know, long it took to develop them, but now we have them and now anyone can use them. Um, so two examples of that that are particularly useful is this n by, nth byte of abstraction. And basically this lets us not actually chop up 256-bit words when we store it into memory. We just kind of hold the 256-bit word itself so we don't have to chop it up into a bunch of different symbolic expressions. Um, but then if an individual byte is accessed from that 256-bit words, we kind of return an expression that says, you know, this is the byte that you mean. Uh, but otherwise we just hold it in memory. So we, we can kind of optimize for the very common case where you're not actually offsetting and reading an offset of the, of the thing, but then still do the correct thing in the case when you do the offset. So this reduces kind of the size of the symbolic expressions that we use. And then we also have this ABI call data abstraction, which lets you specify, um, instead of saying, you know, I want to call into this, I want to do a verification, verify a contract where I'm calling into it with this call data, which is just a raw byte string, and you know, you have to kind of craft it by hand, which would be really annoying. Instead, you can uh, use directly the function name and the signature and directly the, the typed arguments, and it will kind of desugar that into exactly the bytes that you need uh, to make that call properly, uh, using our knowledge of the ABI encoding. And then another thing that we had to kind of lean on was we modularized how you can do specifications in K. Um, this, this took a, a while to develop, but now it, it seems fairly robust. But basically, we can reuse the same specs for different implementations. And this is kind of interesting because, you know, we then were able to go to, we, we started out with an ERC-20 implemented in Solidity, which is a high-level programming language, and, you know, spent a bunch of time verifying it. And then we were like, okay, let's try Viper 1, which is a different high-level language, and it generated different EVM bytecode. Um, and it turns out they had different behaviors, uh, go figure, uh, because they have different compilers and they have you know, different people writing the code. So that was kind of interesting. So we now have five different implementations of the ERC-20 verified, all with their own different behaviors. Um, and we just kind of stopped at five because we were like, okay, it's time to move on to other contracts that are more useful. But you can kind of look at that and basically they all can reuse parts of the specification that are the same, but then have this small delta for the, the parts that aren't. Um, yeah, so these are uh, a lot of the kind of efforts we've put in. I mean, there's more ongoing efforts um, into making using the verification engine easier, but you know, at the end of the day, if you're doing for, full you know, formal verification of your contracts, it's gonna be difficult. Um, and that concludes my talk as well. So thanks for listening. Um, this is high level conclusion. And here are some sponsors um, that have helped us with this, with this project. Uh, including IOHK, who gave a very generous gift to both the university and the company for advancing this work.